So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers of the conference. Thank you to the chair people. Um, thank you to the other speakers. So far, I've learned an immense amount these last couple days. Um, and for me, most importantly, I want to thank the doctors who have helped you gather health so far. Uh, your courage and your innovation and your focus on your patients um, has been wonderful. It's been inspiring. Um, so I'll tell you a little about myself. So first, my disclaimer is I'm not a doctor. I invite all of your criticism to help me improve and better understand patient care in India and how Gather Health can improve. Um, I'm an American. I live in China. I spend a lot of time in India. And as Dr. Das showed, these are the three leading countries with diabetes in the world. And so, uh, so this is the topic of my talk. Um, we'll structure it in the following ways. Um, I'll get right to it. So there's one last group I want to thank and that is the companies who are pushing the smartphone revolution around the world. Um, I'm sure every person in this room has a smartphone. You use it each in your individual way, and in its own way, it is the person who knows, or it is the thing that knows you the best in the world. And that offers an amazing, amazing opportunity to address a lot of our healthcare needs. We can debate the exact numbers, but we know essentially around the world we have two big issues with treating diabetes. The first is an issue of capacity. There are more diabetics than doctors, and we can see that with the numbers. The other issue is that this overwhelming of healthcare systems has led to worse treatment, right? And that patients who are coming into the system aren't getting all of the lifestyle modification, education they need to reach their targets. And we all experience this every day. There are two big areas that technology can address. The previous speakers have talked about the first area, which is access and capacity. The more efficiently you run your practice, the more, the more patients you can see, right? The more you organize data, the better advice you can give to each patient, right? And that's the, that's the kind of first level, in my opinion. The next opportunity for technology is to support the interventions you give, to be an enabler, to support education, motivation, and patient accountability for following the prescriptions and advice you give. Obviously, medication testing compliance are an easy area, but more difficult is that education component, that lifestyle modification component. Obviously, we've each struggled with coaching our patients to eat better, to exercise more. That's always first line of treatment, but how often do we actually spend the time to do that? The last point, which I think is a very interesting one, um, which many of our speakers have, have identified, is the role of mental health in diabetes. Um, decreasing stress, addressing depression, and making sure these kind of global effects that they'll have on patient care are addressed. I see it as a continuum, right? As we come into the system, right, at first we'll address these basic needs, right, office processes, getting things faster. And then we'll move up and maybe we'll start having better data on our patients. And then we'll maybe recommend our patients to download apps and understand how they can manage on their own. And then doctors like Dr. Ram Chandran and others will start engaging patients through text messaging, pushing out personalized education, reminding them. Some of you, perhaps the more masochistic of you in this room, have given out your phone numbers to patients and allow them to call you or text you directly. And you've taken on the burden of having direct two-way communication. But that's very inefficient. And so I congratulate you on that. And, uh, and I want to help you do that better and create truly holistic patient engagement where your staff can help, a patient's family can help, and we can make that type of two-way communication feasible at a clinical level. I'll talk a little bit about Gather Health now and the way we approach this. We believe that patients need truly holistic care that is led by the doctor, focused on the patient, but includes all of these other groups who can impact patient compliance, patient education, patient motivation, and patient depression. Our system works in the following ways. 
A doctor prescribes it to a patient, just like a medication. The, doctor will, the patient will agree. Your support staff will enroll them. They'll help them download an application on their phone, which will then serve as their virtual clinic, where they can ask questions, they can track their medications, they can track their blood glucose, right? And you can, your team can communicate back to them. So whenever they have a small question in the course of their lives, I'm at a wedding, my schedule has changed, what should I do? That's an opportunity to avoid a hypoglycemia. Right? Should I take the stairs or should I take the elevator? That's a small piece of, piece of education, right? A small moment in their lives where we can improve their adherence with lifestyle change. Right? I'm scared, maybe I have erectile dysfunction. That's an opportunity for motivation. And if you ever need to, and things ever get too stressful doing this remotely, you can always bring patients in, talk to them face to face. There will never be a substitute for the healing power of the human touch. The way this works in practice is that a patient is given a smartphone, their loved one, their caregiver, maybe their daughter or son, can have a companion application which helps them track their, their medications and their testing. And then the care team has a web login that can do have a lot of the features that Dr. Santosh talked about, right? Seeing data, these kind of basic EMR functions are already there. And then this other piece extends those out into the pockets of patients. So we've been live in India in an observational phase. I would call it a phase one phase, uh, phase one opportunity in, uh, in India across seven sites. These doctors agreed, and we gave them very little instruction. We say, use your best judgment, and we'll learn from you. They enrolled 264 patients between May 1st and March 1st of this year, and the patients they enrolled had diabetes. They were their own patients, selected out of their practice, the patients have to have their own phone, and they had to be willing to test the app. And that was it. These are the, the demographics. In general, more, wi more women than men. There was a wide range of age groups, reflecting both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The majority were on insulin and orals. Um, and Doctors were able to give specific blood glucose testing instructions that fit the patient's comfort level. And so sometimes they're asked to test less, and sometimes they're asked to test more. Again, this was an observational trial and reflected real-life clinical practice. And this is what we found. So the first big caveat is that for patients who stayed on the app, they benefited we saw about a 20-point re uh, reduction in mean BG in those first three weeks. And then we saw it stay down over the next 12 weeks. Now, there's a lot of discussion that can happen and should happen around what this means. Patients, obviously, when they first leave your office, are the most motivated that they're going to be in their history of having diabetes, right? That's when you're adjusting prescriptions, titrating insulin, providing the highest level of education. But we all know is that over time, that effect wears off. And so perhaps the way this is, will integrate and the way we'll find out um, this works is that the doctor and their staff have a 20-point effect, and the role of technology is to keep that down. I'm not sure, right? Maybe the way we do this, the way it turned out, is that it's the ongoing titration of medication that keeps it down. It's an opportunity for further research. So returning to that big question, which is who used the app? So one of our biggest findings was that gender didn't impact app usage and age didn't impact app usage. If your patients come in and they are willing to use an app, which is an if, and a provider can teach them and spend five minutes with them to show them how to use an app, they're able to do it. 
So we shouldn't let age be a barrier. We should acknowledge that it has unique challenges, but it's not a barrier. Type 1 diabetics were more motivated and more able to use an app. Insulin reflected that, and they were also more likely. And the number of blood glucose tests you asked for also led to increased app usage. Those three may, may, may go together. Now, overall, about 50% of patients continued using the app at week, I think, week 16, right? And the number one variable that led to the widest range was what practice they came from. And that reflects a lot of things, a lot of things. The internal process for the provider, were they able to spend time and train them, really? Who's the support staff? How tech savvy are they, right? In the best scenarios, we saw 80% of patients actively using the app at week 16. That's pretty good. And so this is a big focus for us, is figuring out how do we give more support and make this clinically realistic. Another big finding that we had was that patients don't overwhelm the team with messages. The average patient asks two questions a month. Based on our analysis, about 15% of those I would define as needing the doctor's attention. The majority of them were lots of basic things. Where should I inject my insulin? Those nutrition and lifestyle questions I brought up before. And this is supported by other research we've seen, which is that support staff, nurses, educators are able to deliver effective care. And a lot of that will reflect what we've seen earlier in the conference when people talk about lifestyle change, right? Some have said that diabetes is a very simple, simple disease, right? The treatment, motivation, right? Encouragement and self-understanding. So one success story I'll leave you with um, to bring this home. Um, was a male, age 44, he had type 2 diabetes. Um, and in 91 days, uh, he took his blood glucose down by about 50 points. And the topics he discussed with his team showed a, a wide range of issues that I had mentioned. Um, he had sent 23 messages to the team, got 14 responses back, and this gentleman was able to change his life. So, obviously, this is the vanguard of what's happening. We need to understand a lot more. Um, we need wider usage in different patient groups. We need to better understand the effects and design of education, understand the impact of family and how they can be efficiently brought into it. At the end, which is sometimes an overlooked topic, which is you have to make it practical for the average physician to use this and the average patient to use it, right? Um, and that's, we're, all, we're working on that and more things. We have an, a randomized control trial in progress in India, and uh, we're looking to do a lot more research and learn a lot more. Um, I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry, and one of the reasons I left is that you research a drug and it stays the same, right? Week one, week five, it's all the same. The great thing about software is that it has to change. Like Dr. Das mentioned, software has to be improving. And so when we learn things from our research and we get feedback from our doctors, <coughs> we're able to improve it and we're able to track that on outcomes. Um, so I'll leave you with that thought and I invite any questions either now or at the end. Thank you very much.